She's been Premier of Ontario for less than three months, but the inbox on her desk is sky high. How to get a budget deal with the NDP, how to create a new process for citing gas plants so we don't get a repeat of the Mississauga and Oakville fiascos. Not to mention LCBO workers could walk off the job before the holiday weekend. Here's Ontario Premier Kathleen Wynne, also the MPP for Don Valley West, and as always, we welcome you back here to TVO. Thanks, Steve. Pleasure well, to be here. And let's do a little housekeeping off the top. You may have heard there was a hockey game of some significance last night, and I got a little it carried away. Tragic. It was it, tragic. It actually was. It was tragic. It actually was. And so my voice is not great today, so apologies for the bad voice. We want to also remind people, you were here a couple of weeks ago talking about gender politics, and at that time we said... That's a single issue program, but you will be back here soon to talk about other things that are more in the news. And here you are, so we appreciate you fulfilling that commitment. And as always on this program, we tend not to cover the waterfront on 25 different things. We tend to focus. So we're going to talk about two things. We're going to talk about the budget process, and we're going to talk about gas plants. Great. Good to go? Yep, good to go. Andrea Horvath this morning uh, released uh, a third uh, item that she would like to see in order to get her signature on your budget, so to speak. She wants the Ombudsman to have oversight of health care. She wants a parliamentary budget office, if you like, like they have in Ottawa. And this morning, a more transparent, accountable way of tracking whatever new revenues you get from rolled tolls to spend on transit. So first thing, your reaction to that. So let me, can I just, can I just lay out what's happened here? Because uh, we, we did a lot of work in the run-up to the budget, listening to people across the province, uh, listening to the opposition. I had three meetings with Andrea and uh, four meetings with Tim Hudak. And, uh, you know, we really tried to write a budget that reflected all of those things that we had heard and reflected what I know and what we know needs to be done in the province, which is we need more jobs and we need to help people in their day-to-day -day lives. So I had those meetings with, uh, with Andrea. I've actually been trying to get a meeting with her since March now, since the end of March. She's and turned you down. She has turned me down. Um, I understand today she said that, uh, you know, maybe we can have a meeting by the end of the week and that would be great. But I would have loved to have had a meeting with her in the final couple of weeks before the budget because we had done all this work and I wanted to, you you know, I wanted to hear where she was coming from on the things that we were going to put in the budget. That didn't happen. So now there's a new set of, uh, of requests coming forward. And I'm not going to deal with them one-on-one, -on -one, you know, I mean, one at a time. I need to have a conversation with her. I need to sit down with her and we need to talk about, okay, what is the, what's the end game here? How do we, how do we uh, get, some, uh, get some agreement on, on where we're going to go? We're not going to I'm not going to. We're not going to renegotiate the budget from the ground up because we've done so much of that upfront work. Uh, I think that the uh, budget officer, for example, I think it's an interesting idea, but we're not going to start afresh with the budget. So I look forward to the meeting with her, but it's, it is time to make a decision. People have, you know, people have been in touch with me. They're calling us. They're calling our members saying, what are you guys doing? When are you going to decide? You've already done a lot. And so When's the decision going to come? Well, she's been pretty careful to say, I'm not drawing any lines in the sand, but I have 18 members, and if you want our votes, you're going to have to play ball, and this is politics. So you are going to have to meet right. her somewhere on and this I one. Am, and, and as I say, I have been trying to get a meeting, and I'm more than willing to have that meeting with her and talk about what the, you know, what the whole package looks like. But I can't, you know, I can't sit here and tell you exactly which pieces uh, are going to move and which aren't, because we need to know what the what the, the whole picture looks like. So is it your expectation that they will come to the legislature and vote either up or down on the budget as it currently exists? I need to have the conversation with Andrea. I need a face-to-face -face meeting with her because some of the things that she has talked about in the last few days, Steve, I, I'm not even sure what she means by them. So in terms of the, uh, the revenue stream for transit, for example, I believe that we need a revenue stream for transit. We've put in the budget process uh, HOT lanes, which are high occupancy toll lanes, but that's just a piece of what we would need to do. Of course there's going to be a plan. So when Andrea says she needs a plan, well, yeah, there's going to be a plan. Well, what and there's... she means is revenues going into yeah. a specific pot, not into general. Well, and I've said that. Anything. I've said that absolutely, that it would be a dedicated revenue stream. So I need to understand better what it is she's uh, exactly talking about. But are you open to making any changes in this budget? I have said that, uh, you know, for example, the accountability officer I think is an interesting idea. But is it exactly what she's asking for? I, I can't 
tell you that because I haven't had that conversation with her. I really need, I really need to understand better where she's coming from on some of these things. I don't expect you to negotiate it here in the no. studio, obviously, but you'll forgive me for inquiring. Are you open, for example, to further tightening corporate tax loopholes, which might realize a little more revenue to spend on things that she and you are both interested in? Well, we're, you know, we're working on that. I mean, that's, that's something that uh, uh, Charles has, Charles Souza, the finance minister, has been in touch with the federal government on. So we're already working on that front. We're in a minority parliament, and I, I completely understand that it is my responsibility and my job to, uh, to work with the other parties, which is why I had the meetings in the first place, which is why the process looked the way it did in the run-up to this budget. So of course I'm open to meeting with her. I've been open to meeting with her for weeks. I hope that we'll be able to have that, uh, have that encounter by the end of this week and have a better idea of how we're going to go forward. Just give us a sense of how it works. Will it be just the two of you in the room together? Uh, there will be, there will be uh, at least a staff member with each of us. And does it go like this? I'll give you this if you give me that? Well, it's been more, I would say, it's been more uh, a sort of, this is where we are, this is where we are. It, it hasn't been a, a trading back and forth in that way, because she brought forward some concerns. I said, those are concerns that, uh, that we share. We'd like, to, we'd like to find some common ground. What we didn't have and what I was a bit surprised about and what I would have liked is a bit more of a, a back and forth about, okay, let's talk about auto insurance. Now, how can that work? Because I'm concerned, Andrea, for example, that if we push the industry too hard, they will say, well, we're just not going to write auto insurance for certain segments of the population. Well, we can't let that happen. So how will we implement a 15% reduction on average across the province? I would have liked to have that conversation with her. Now, I understand politically why she maybe didn't want to have that conversation with me, but you know, I think that's how you get to good policy solutions, is you actually go back and forth a bit and come to an agreement. Well, last thing on this. I mean, obviously, polls show, if I can put it colloquially, you're eating a bit of her lunch these days, right? You're, you're taking some of her support, so why would she want to make your life any easier? Well, you know, I think that we're, we're in a minority situation, so if we if we can all behave as statespeople and actually work together in the best interests of the province, I think everybody wins. I don't think, I don't think it's a zero-sum game. I think that the people of Ontario are generous enough that if they see politicians who are endeavoring to really find the right answers, that uh, they're, you know, they're willing to give us credit for that. Okay, moving on. Your favorite topic, gas plants. <laughs> Uh, as we suggested in the intro, it is not unprecedented, but it is pretty extraordinary for a premier and a former premier to be testifying at a public hearing, um, you know, so close on the heels to one another. Dalton McGuinty a couple of weeks ago, you last week. Uh, let's start with this. What did you find to be the most interesting revelation from former Premier McGuinty's testimony before the Legislative Committee on this? Well, I think where I am on this, Steve, is that um, this, this whole situation, uh, the, the relocation of the gas plants, the cost of that relocation, uh, it shouldn't have happened. You know, it shouldn't have happened. And nothing that I've heard in any of the testimony has convinced me that, that it should have happened the way it did. Um, I believe that the gas plants were sited in the wrong place in the first instance, so the relocation should have happened. But the way it happened and the lack of clarity, remember when I came into this office, the issue was about documents and were there documents available and, and being produced that were being asked for. So, um, so that it, and then it morphed into a conversation about uh, the cost. And, you know, so I think where I am coming from is that this shouldn't have happened the way it did. We've had a lot of testimony from a lot of people now, and that needed to happen. That's why we opened up the process. That's why we said, let's get all the questions on the table and let's get the answers. That's what I said during the leadership okay. needed to happen. Did he give any answers that you didn't know? Well, I mean, th this, is, this is what I'm saying. I don't think that there's anything in the, the testimony that has been given at the committee that uh, changes the fundamental fact that uh, the process was bad, it shouldn't have happened the way it did. What it has done for me is it's, it's made it clear to me that as the leader, as the premier, I need to check in with the people of Ontario and I, let, I need to let them know where I am. And I am very sorry that 
this happened the way it did. I'm very sorry about the mistakes that we made. We made mistakes. Our government made mistakes. Things happened that shouldn't have happened, and they happened in a way that they shouldn't have happened. And I am, I'm very sorry for that. And I take responsibility as having been part of that government. And more than that, Steve, as the Premier now, I take responsibility for putting a process in place that will ensure that this won't happen again. Uh let me just do this because uh, some people don't follow this as carefully as you and I do. That's further than you've gone to date. You have to date always said, I regret that it happened, but you have purposefully, I think, declined to give an apology. Yeah. Did you just give an apology? I did just give an apology. And, and here's the thing. We've, we've heard from pretty much all the people who were directly involved. And uh, my sense from the people that I've heard from, uh, regular Ontarians who, who aren't close to this, is that they want to hear that. They want to hear how I feel as the leader and what I think uh, needs to be said. And I believe that people need to hear that. The people of Ontario need to hear that I'm sorry because I am. I am sorry. I'm sorry that we didn't have a better process up front. I'm sorry that we didn't cite those gas plants better. And that's why a, a new protocol needs to be in place. Okay, I'm going to push you a little further then. Um, you didn't actually make the decision to move the plant. Your predecessor made the decision. Dalton McGinty made the decision. He said that in front of the committee. Right. Uh, should he be offering an apology? He didn't at the committee. So there's been, there's been a lot of testimony. People have heard uh, what, what individuals had to say. I have, to, I have to be straight with, with you and with the, the people of the province about where I am at this moment, and this is where I am. I think what's needed right now is for the Premier to say, I'm sorry about this, and I'm sorry that the process wasn't better, and I'm sorry that those mistakes were made, and we can't let them happen again. So I just, I have to, I have to be true to what I believe needs to happen, Steve, and that's what I think needs to happen right now. But don't get me wrong. Uh, I believe that we need to move on now, and we need to move on not, not so that we can abdicate responsibility or, or leave it behind us in some kind of negative, dark way, but taking the lessons with us, put in place a better process. You know, that's why the, the OPA and the Independent Energy uh, Organization are putting together a, a regional energy plan. That's, that's what we need in place. I know you want to move on, but I'm not ready no, to no, move on fine. yet. No, so, that's fine. Uh, he didn't apologize before the committee, and I want to be sure I understand what you're saying. Are you saying he should have? I'm not going to speak for anyone else. I, you know, I have the deepest of respect for my colleagues, and uh, I worked with Dalton for nearly a decade, and I believe in what he did. There was so much good that we did in, in government. He appeared before the committee. He said what he believed he needed to say, Steve, and he told he gave the information that he had. And so I have huge respect for that. I'm in this chair now, and it's my responsibility to, to level with the people of Ontario about how I see the situation and how I feel about the situation and what I'm hearing from them. I'm hearing people say that they want to hear an apology for the parts of uh, this that our government uh, messed up, you know, so the, the they mistakes. Got it, they got it from you, but they haven't got it from him. Well, I'm the Premier, so that's, that's, what, that's what I'm, uh, I'm able to offer. But it was his decision. Well, you know what, I was part of the government, and uh, I, I take no, uh, I put no distance between myself and uh, Premier McGuinty on this. You know, he was, he was a great leader and Premier, and I was proud to serve with him. And I'm the Premier now, and this situation has unfolded the way it's unfolded, and it's my responsibility to do what I believe is right. Do you think he showed adequate contrition at that hearing, given that his decision is going to cost taxpayers and ratepayers 600 million bucks? So this is, this is what I'm really sorry about, you know, that, that, that the decisions we made as a government and the, the lack of good process, because what we didn't do, Steve, is we didn't listen to municipalities well enough. We didn't listen to communities. Uh, that wasn't taken into account in the way that it should have been. There were even reports uh, about air quality and, uh, you know, the, uh, the overtaxed air shed in, in some of those regions. And we didn't, for whatever reason, pay close enough attention to those. Those were the mistakes. So I have, to, I have to learn from that. And so as we put a new plan in place, we have to make sure that we don't duplicate those mistakes. Okay, here's the next question. Why should the people of Ontario accept the apology? 
Well, because I think that it is, it is really important that people are able to relate to their leaders in a way that uh, says, OK, you've done these good things. You've done these bad things, and I want to hear, I want to hear what you're going to do to fix those bad things. And I, I've talked about that for a number of weeks, you know, the, the go forward. But I also want to know that you're a human being. And I want to know that these issues affect you and that you are, you're able to articulate how they affect you. Now, that may just be my particular disposition, but I think that that makes a relationship stronger. If I can understand uh, how people are feeling and we can relate on not just an intellectual level, but we can actually relate on a, on a human and emotional level. So it, it's, it is important to me for the people of Ontario to know me and to know that I'm going to tell them when I think we've made a mistake and when we need to move on. And it's important not just for this issue, it's important going forward so that if, if they can trust me to, to be open with them, and I came into this leadership position saying I was going to be as open as I possibly could, and I have been, and the issue has unfolded, and now we're at a point where I believe that this is what needs to be said. Okay, that's okay. our time. Uh, since you mentioned a human and emotional business, I guess I should take this opportunity to wish you a happy birthday because I think the next one starts with a six. It does. <laughs> Unbelievably, it does. You're, you're turning 60 in a couple of weeks? Tuesday. On Tuesday? On Tuesday. Yeah, yeah. I will be 60. But you know, uh, 60 is the new, I don't know, 45. <laughs> you won't. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, Premier Kathleen Wynne, always good of you to come to TVO for your Thank visits. You. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.